everybody for Thanks so much uh, for, for joining us today. Um, my name is uh, Will Wilson. I, I teach here at the Santa Fe Community College and I'm gonna um, introduce a project that I've been working on with um, folks from Janae College. Um, and I should start off uh, by saying, Will Wilson, Yinishya, Kia Ani Inshle, the Belagana Bashashchi, Tabaha, Da Shiche, do Irish and Welsh, da Chanelis. Um, I, I was born in San Francisco, uh, but I spent a lot of time uh, also growing up in Twinanestizi, um, in the Tuba City area. Um, went to Tuba boarding. Um, and really, those, those years, I think, were really formative to me and, and kind of inspired a lot of, of the work that I'm, I'm doing now. Um, so I want to talk about reframing indigenous remediation, uh, uranium on Dineta, which is um, a project that I'm working on collaboratively with um, Diné College. So this is a speaker series um, that we're um, doing that's going to include uh, a number of perspectives, interdisciplinary perspectives on, on uh, people who are dealing with uh, the issue of um, environmental injustice, uh, uranium um, extraction and processing that have happened historically in the Navajo Nation, um, and the you know kind of continued legacy of that. Uh, so, for example, the next speaker is going to be Chris Shuey, um, who works with the Southwest Resource and Inter Information Center. Um, and he will talk about um, their uranium impact assessment program for which is for decades actually been kind of dealing with these issues and uh, he's a co-investigator now for the Diné project um, on the Navajo birth cohort study uh, which is actually a collab with the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque um, after that we'll hear from Dr. Chip Thomas who's um, an IHS physician um, I believe based in Chanto, um, and he's also an amazing photographer and public artist. Uh, and then we'll hear from Tanya Willard, who's a curator, Clay Benali, who's an activist and artist as well, and Tommy Rock. Um, some of these are to be announced because we're still kind of organizing the dates, uh, but we're hoping to get between 10, 15 uh, different perspectives on this issue, and eventually um, they'll all be on a website. So this is, you know, an example of Chris Shuey's um, work with the Southwest Resource Information Center. Um, so he's going to give us a little more context, I think, about the history of different um, kind of policy and also different programs that are that are kind of built around um, this issue of contamination on, on the Navajo Nation and other communities as well. So I think their work extends beyond Navajo and is dealing with people who were um, affected by the, um, you know, the kind of negative externalities of uranium extraction and processing uh, in, the, in the region. Um, so we're hoping to build this resource and how's it here? Uh, it'll be at DineArt.org. Um, uh, so look for this um, talk and, and the other talks at this site. And we'll also start kind of building out links and other resources associated with each speaker's um, talk and, and their practice. Um, I want to say thank you to the Native Arts and Culture Foundation, who is, you know, very generously and I think kind of, I don't know, visionarily, that's a word, um, supporting this kind of work. They're an amazing organization that, that supports the work of um, indigenous creatives uh, really throughout the world, um, but more a focus on, on the US and Canada uh, region. Um, the SHIFT grant is a two-year grant that specifically um, addresses kind of notions of social environmental um, economic and um, 
social justice issues through a native lens, right? And so we got a two-year grant to support this work from this organization. If you're interested in, you know, looking into this organization, they do amazing work. They've um, uh, supported uh, artists for, you know, more than a decade now. So it's a great resource, especially if you're thinking about kind of moving towards this kind of work in the future. Um, this is also being supported by another kind of newer organization called the NDN Collective. And I was a recipient of one of their radical imagination grants. Um, so I should say, you know, that I'm very um, much thankful for the support as well. And so this is another site or organization to kind of think about, to look at for, for support of kind of indigenous creative practice. Um, as well as Diné College, right? So I'm super excited to be able to kind of share this with um, the Diné community. Um, and hopefully after we move through this pandemic that we're all kind of navigating, um, we'll actually be able to come together uh, for some, some photo workshops, for some talks. Um, and you know, I just want to say a big thanks to the Diné College collaborators, Professor of Photography Gabrielle Cruz, um, Professor of Art History Carla Britton, um, a Diné uh, amazing recent MFA, Kayla Jackson, who's our grant manager and just kind of, I don't know, an amazing organizer just in general, um, and um, Dean Willetto. Uh, who's the Dean of the School of Arts, Humanities, and, and English there at Diné College. So um, the objectives uh, of the grant are um, kind of twofold at first. Uh, we're, I've been doing uh, a drone-based survey of abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation for the last few years. Um, and we'd like to continue that practice and also share that um, with in particular, students in the photo program in, in um, Professor Cruz's uh, department. Um, we're also going to be able to bring some some nice equipment to support that that research. Um, we're doing this reframing Indigenous remediation speaker series, and we will collaborate hopefully um, on an exhibition, potentially a publication, and then. Um, I've also been working with some students here in Santa Fe to develop a kind of database to, to go along with a lot of information and work that's already been done um, to help people quickly kind of locate and identify resources associated with the various uh, mines. So there's only, you know, there's over 250 of these sites on the Navajo Nation alone. Um, so I'd just like to read a paragraph that was part of the grant application. Um, so Diné College and Santa Fe based artist Will Wilson will collaborate on reframing indigenous remediation uranium on Dineta. Uh, we propose to reframe environmental re remediation through indigenous knowledge systems to address the legacy of uranium extraction and processing on the Navajo Nation. Our project has two primary components. First, a photographic survey of the AUMs, the abandoned uranium mines. Um, as well as frontline communities that are most impacted uh, by them. Um, and this will be done in collaboration with Diné College students and faculty. Um, so that's one, that's the survey. And then secondly is the speaker series, right? Which is a lecture series hosted by Diné College that brings together the interdisciplinary expertise of indigenous artists, academics, scientists, policymakers, elders, and, and activists. So kind of recognizing that, you know, a complex problem needs a complex solution and it's important to gather the viewpoints, I think, of many people who are, who are working, because people have been working on this, these issues for decades. Um, I'm gonna shift a little bit and talk a little bit about my practice um, and kind of how I arrived uh, at, you know, this, this dream of kind of a collaboration around this issue. Um, this image in particular, you know, for me as a photographer, as a Navajo person, 
um, is it's just very moving. And my mother actually uh, a few years ago, well, actually early, more than a few years ago, a couple of decades ago when I was kind of starting uh, my, my kind of work in photography, she brought me this image and she said, I, I remember this event. Um, and this is actually a photograph of her and her sisters, um, May Bighorse and Sally McCabe. And, you know, they were on their way uh, to Tuba City Trading Post from the summer sheep camp. Um, and, you know, they were very well equipped. Uh, they had water, but they ran across a photographer who had kind of an editorial uh, assignment and, and perhaps like a vision that he wanted to create through photography of, of you know, poor indigenous people, essentially. Um, I think my family was pretty well off. Uh, you know, we had um, probably 500 head of sheep. My grandfather had fields in Curly Valley below to the city. Um, you know, and this is how they were getting along. They, they had this exchange with this photographer. There was some money um, exchanged and, and he walked away with this image. So, you know, I, I think it's just very fascinating to me, the stories that photography can tell. Um, so early on, you know, I was kind of, I think, drawn to a documentary vision of photography and wanted to like kind of share uh, my vision of my experience um, with my family in and around Tuba City um, through photography. Uh, I'm not a native speaker of, of Navajo. And so, you know, a lot of times when I was growing up, uh, on, on the res, in some ways I was mute, right? Because Navajo is the predominant kind of day-to-day -day language that was used in discourse. So I kind of always figured I was like in translation or something, you know, trying to figure out the world. But like when I found photography, it became like this empowering, I think, a way for me to be able to express myself. And so I really was I'm kind of drawn to that. Um, so I ended up going to college at Oberlin College, which is a small liberal arts school in Northeast Ohio. And then I ended up getting my MFA at the University of New Mexico uh, in Albuquerque. And so this is my um, MFA show back in 97. Um, so uh, a more recent project that's kind of going ongoing, but started back in 2005, 2004, um, is this project called Autoimmune Response. So Autoimmune Response um, is kind of telling in the name in that it refers to autoimmune diseases, which um, disproportionately affect indigenous populations really worldwide. Um, and it's associated with kind of rapid changes in um, climate, foodways, economies, um, and you know, that seemed a fitting name for this series. It's, it's about this Navajo man's kind of wanderings in a, in a world that's become, you know, toxic to him. And, and he's trying to, want, he's wondering why, and he's trying to like kind of work through that. So that's where the response is, right? The notion of kind of taking agency, figuring out how to, how to make it in this world. Um, he finds uh, his own Hogan, um, and it becomes like this resource center um, for him, this laboratory of sorts to kind of journey out from and, and make work. Um, as I said, this is ongoing, but you know, in this series, I'm kind of performing the, the character, the protagonist. Um, and I'm also thinking of kind of what's making the world toxic, how this person is relating to that. And also trying to maybe incorporate some some Diné or Navajo like ways of thinking, ways of knowing, epistemologies. Um, you know, Born of Water and Monster Slayer were the hero twins who rid the the world of, of monsters that enabled kind of humans, you know, to to make it in this world. And so I was trying to reference that in this image. Um, actually, our character. Um, builds his own uh, kind of shelter, right? And it's based on the, the traditional Navajo architectural form, uh, the Hogan, right? Except it's a little different. Um, this was the first kind of complete uh, exhibition of the work. It was at the Heard Museum down in Phoenix uh, in 2005. 
Um, since then, you know, I've kind of continued to develop this narrative over the years. Um, the Hogan becomes a greenhouse eventually and for the cultivation of indigenous food species. Um, I've had the opportunity to show this work at a number of locations. Uh, one of my favorite was the Denver Botanical Gardens, um, where they actually were, um, they offered to propagate the seed that I was using, right? And I was sourcing the seed from an organization called Native Seed Search, um, which is like a, um, an heirloom variety repository for food species in the Southwest, right? So they had um, like Navajo corns and um, Pueblo beans and squash. Um, and so I was able to, you know, send them that seed, they, they grew it and kind of dream, I think, like a potential solution for some of these situations, right? Um, but it's also a backdrop for more of the, the image making with photography. Um, so this series is ongoing, you know, I have other people who I'm kind of bringing in um, to, to the narrative. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, at some point, I'll kind of like think it out and I think really fill out the story, but you know, it's kind of an ongoing project. This is a little bit of a shift and unfortunately in my preparation for this, I somehow threw out the video that's associated with this, but I wanted to talk about uh, another thing that I think is common in, in my work that I think about, like, you know, I grew up around sheep herding and weaving and you know watching my aunt and my grandmother do this process right um and so i always dreamed about making a, a rug of my own and i was able to do that in 2012 in collaboration with some other artists pamela brown um joy farley who are sisters who grew up in um Holcomb and actually started the high school weaving club there um, Dylan McLaughlin, who uh, we're hoping to get as a speaker for this series, who's um, a recent graduate of the MFA um, Art and Ecology program at UNM, but he's an amazing uh, videographer and filmmaker. Um, my friend Jamie Smith, who's a Cherokee Choctaw organizer, and myself. So we put this together, and if we have time at the end, perhaps I will go to my website and show you the video associated with this. So it's based on um, a rug that my grandmother wove about well, 50 years now. Um, and we took the design, scanned it in and transformed it in that we included QR codes. So you can scan the rug and it goes to a kind of movie about the rug. But I kind of want to just lay down a foundation for my own practice and then maybe we can make some connections between this broader project, right? And so, this isn't my image, this is an image um, of the United Nuclear Corporation Church Rock uranium mill spill, which occurred in uh, 1979, and is actually by the numbers, by the, the amount of radioactivity emitted, the worst nuclear disaster in US history. Um, not people, not many people know about it, unfortunately. Um, you know, I think that has to do with the community that affected that it affected uh, only three months earlier, I think, Three Mile Island happened. And, you know, most people in the United States know about that, that nuclear accident. But, you know, it's an example, I think, of environmental justice or environmental racism that, you know, this this isn't as well known as it as it has been. Um, so kind of knowing about this situation and then also growing up near uh, rare metals. Uh, so this isn't my photograph either, but um, when I was a kid, we used to go hang out and play at this site. Um, it's the site of a former uranium uh, mill outside of Tuba City. It's about four miles from Tuba. Um, and there's a Google image and now it's a super fun site, right? Um, I should say, that if I go back to this image, um, just a little bit about the background of this. Uh, the Navajo Nation uh, produced more than half the country's domestic uranium reserves from the 1940s to the 1960s. So, you know, for the development of the first nuclear weapon um, and also during the Cold War, right, and the nuclear arms buildup uh, and continued as a site of commercial mining until the 1980s. 
The U.S. Atomic Energy Commission was the sole purchaser of the uranium until 1971, right? So only the U.S. government could uh, purchase uranium until 71, um, often through these kind of shell um, or front organizations or corporations. Uh, despite well-documented health hazards associated with uranium extraction and um, processing, Diné workers were never warned of the danger. And today, Diné families live amid radioactive tailings, drink contaminated water, water and breathe toxic dust. Uh, the Navajo Nation EPA has identified more than 521 abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation. Uh, and the vast majority of them have not been reclaimed or remediated. Um, so part of this project, I think, is just, you know, a bearing witness to these different sites. Um, this is what rare metals looks like today. Uh, and, you know, I should say that uh, drone photography has kind of opened up, I think, an amazing kind of new tool uh, for imaging these sites, particularly, you know, out on, on the nation where everything is so vast and it's really hard to appreciate the kind of size and scale of these different sites and even you know the potential vector of contamination from the ground right they don't look like much from the ground because you can't really see them or, or conceptualize them but if you use a drone and you send it up a couple hundred feet you know your view is transformed um so this is the same rare metal site, um, a super fun site, and you can see the foundation, um, the foundations of the worker housing. Um, this is a map uh, that kind of initially inspired this project. Uh, I was calling it connecting the dots at that point, but this is a map of you know over 520 uh, abandoned uranium mines um, on the nation. Um, Initially, I kind of visited the site of the United Nuclear uh, Corporation Church Rock spill, and these are the evaporation ponds. Um, you know, water, of course, is is life, and it's so important uh, out on the very arid uh, nation. And it's interesting; so many of these sites are very, very close to important water sources. This is more um, out in the west. This is Babbitt Ranch, which is just. Uh, you know, technically south of, of the nation, um, but it's also right next to the um, Little Colorado River that flows through Cameron eventually and then, you know, into, into the Grand Canyon. Um, but this is, you know, a site um, where also, I think, a lot of these, these sites are just depressions in the ground, you know, so when the water does come, uh, when the rains do come, they fill up and, you know, animals, livestock, they go to water sources to drink. And that's one of the the avenues or vectors, you know, of contamination through sheep, through cattle, uh, livestock that, that we eat, um, and then we get exposed to the contamination. Um, so this is another site that's like, I mean, kind of photographically impressive, particularly with the drone, Mexican Hat, Utah. Uh, there was a um, uranium processing mill here as well. Um, and they decided to use this site as a disposal cell for you know much of the um, contamination that happened in the Monument Valley uh, region. Um, you can actually see Monument Valley on the horizon line there. Um, and, you know, I just I think it's kind of ironic that uh, the same year that this mill was um, was started uh, is the year that um, John Ford's The Searchers, which is probably the most kind of, I don't know, known or important American Western movie was was filmed and produced with, you know, John Wayne and, and this narrative about kind of saving um, this woman who had been uh, kidnapped by, by the Indians. But anyway, you know, no one paid much attention, I think, to what was going on uh, kind of over Forest Gump Hill there. Um, so, uh, you know, just a little bit more about the drone, like you can have a shot like this and kind of understand the full scale of it, and then you can use it to get closer, right? And so you can see a little red dot there. That's my tent and my truck. And then I noticed this thing out in the middle of this field of, you know, 
river rocks that they've used to cover um, the disposal cell. And there's this strange monument out in the middle of the uh, disposal cell that talks about the date of closure being July 20th, um, 1994. Dry tons of tailing, 4,400,000, and that's tons. And then it talks about the, the radioactivity associated with that. Um, you know, something else about the drone, um, oops, I forgot to put the video in there. Uh, you're um, also able to, you know, send the drone to places that you might not want to, to go yourself, um, just because of the exposure. These are sites that are not actually on the nation, but they are kind of at the base of, you know, our southern sacred mountain, um, just outside of Grants. Um, and they are also remediation sites. Um, this is right behind the Cameron Trading Post uh, and, and motel there. There's a, a, a particularly hot site. I think something, you know, that is also very heartening is to think about how the nation has shifted you know, from from being like this kind of an energy resource kind of uh, producer. And, um, you know, recently they announced the, I think it's a 200 megawatt solar um, generating station that's going to go out, outside of Cameron, you know. So I definitely applaud um, the people who are behind that initiative. Um, this is uh, just a quick shot of the Google Doc that we're kind of amassing as kind of a database. So hopefully you'll just be able to kind of look, maybe we'll divide it up by chapter, by region um, and click, and then you can access um, the EPA um, site screening reports, which are kind of, you know, they're all publicly available, but they're, they're somewhat hidden in that it takes a little bit of sleuthing to find them right uh, it's a little bit hard to tell from this image but that photograph there is um, some contractors they're probably um, navajo folks who are doing two things they're kind of walking the perimeter and through the mine sites with one like um, you know something similar to a geiger counter that's registering the amount of um, radiation and then also a GPS tracker. So when you drill down with these um, reports and maps, and this is kind of the Western region where I'm doing most of kind of my recent uh, survey photography um, at in that area because that's where, where I'm from and where my family is. Um, but when you drill down, um, you'll eventually get to the specific site screening reports, right? And they look like this. And this one, for instance, the AB number five abandoned uranium mine. You know, these are all PDFs that are publicly available. Um, they're just kind of scattered and, and, you know, being able to put them all in one place, I think, is, is a service that we could provide or do. Um, so this is on the uh, top right hand corner is kind of the walkthrough of the space. And so just from a practical perspective, I thought I'd share like, you know, what I do with this. So I find this, I read the report, and then they have GPS coordinates on them. So you can then put that into Google Maps and find the site. Um, this one actually was wrongly um, kind of addressed. And so I had to pull back and like look at the landscape and compare it against you know, the actual uh, map underneath this report and was able to find that it matched up with a location up here instead uh, and was able to go photograph that area. Um, so this is, these are some examples of some of the other kind of sites. This one, for, for instance, uh, has had some remediation done to it. Um, and, and then this, um, if you're from the Shiprock region, you're probably familiar with this. This is kind of about behind the fairgrounds and then right next to the, um, the, uh, the river there, um, just the San Juan. Um, and, you know, again, kind of this iconic photographic uh, landmark on the horizon. Um, but not many people focus on this other stuff. Um, 
this is, if you're interested in, in what a uranium processing mill actually looks like or does, is the last kind of traditional uranium mill in the country. And it's located in Utah in White Mesa um, between Blanding and Bluff. And it's two miles upgrade from the Ute Mountain uh, Reservation. And those folks are particularly concerned about, you know, the potential for water and, and contamination. Um, and so this is kind of a, a drone um, survey of, of that area too. Again, using, you know, a technology that's kind of newly available to image something that I think historically has been really hard to photograph. Um, and I'm going to kind of wrap it up with a, a example of one way that I, you know, as a, an individual artist have tried to kind of process some of this and it was an installation. Um, and um, exhibition at the University of Texas at Austin's um, visual art Center so i'm going to turn down the volume here, so in case you have to. <laughs> listen through a, an advertisement as I link to the YouTube. Um, so click on there. Just inside the northern edge of the Navajo Nation sits the small town of Halchita, just across the San Juan River from Mexican Hat, Utah. Here, the U.S. Department of Energy created the Mexican Hat Disposal Cell in 1995 as part of the Uranium Mill Tailings Remedial Action Program. That year, the U.S. government buried 4.4 million tons of radioactive tailings from the surrounding community in a pit covering 68 acres in the desert. This included mining waste, processing facilities, a school building, homes, and other structures infiltrated by radiation. From the nearby tourist attraction of Monument Valley, just 25 miles away, you'd never know it was there. Santa Fe-based artist Will Wilson photographed this site and others as part of a project where he intends to document each of the 523 known abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation that are in various states of treatment by the U.S. government. Wilson, a Diné or Navajo artist, spent his formative years living near Tuba City on the western edge of the Navajo Nation. The sites he photographs, some so large they encompass the town surrounding them, and others just holes in the ground, are remnants of an era of nuclear weapons development and testing that have left the southwest region with a legacy of toxicity and destruction. Uranium was mined heavily throughout the Navajo Nation beginning in the early 1940s when the United States government sought to build and successfully detonate the world's first atomic bomb. As the radioactive material was extracted and processed by mostly Navajo workers, its particles nestled in their skin, clothing, hair, and lungs, where they would bring it back to their families. A new tower-like structure designed for the Visual Arts Center references uranium and the tower that lifted the infamous gadget bomb during the Trinity nuclear test on July 16, 1945. In this exhibition, however, Wilson transforms the tower into a harbinger of light instead of destruction. It makes clear that even in moments of darkness, there is the potential for new stories and healing. Wilson also recalls U.S. nuclear history and its contemporary legacy through his new series of photographs titled Survey also known as Connecting the Dots. As the title indicates, in this project, Wilson attempts to survey the hundreds of abandoned uranium mines within and along the borders of the Navajo Nation to create a visual record of the largely overlooked history of resource extraction there. Some of these places, like rare metals in Arizona and Mexican Hat in Utah, have been designated as Superfund sites by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency making them among the most toxic places in the world. Wilson uses camera and drone technology to document views of these unseen places with unremitting attention. In this exhibition, survey converges with autoimmune response, or AIR for short. AIR defies popular tropes of the vanishing Indian and instead shows a post-apocalyptic future where a Diné man, known only as the protagonist, is the lone survivor. 
Wilson plays the protagonist throughout the air series in a performative extension of himself, and we follow their wanderings through landscapes poisoned by nuclear devastation. Wilson's future speculations also take the shape of a series of structures that together form an architecture of apocalypse. Air Lab is a skeletal steel hogan, a reference to the customary Diné dwelling that serves multiple purposes between home, shelter, and ceremony, and is transformed in one iteration into a greenhouse full of indigenous plant life and medicines cultivated by Marika Alvarado, a local Lipan Mescalero Apache medicine woman. Her wisdom and healing practice provides a local counterpoint to the widespread ecological destruction highlighted in Wilson's photographs. A second air lab in the VAC courtyard becomes a meditative sanctuary to consider the imbalance caused by resource extraction and Diné lives. Throughout air survey, Wilson bears witness to atrocity while also imagining ways out of it. Through photography, installation, and performance, Wilson's work addresses the balance required to maintain ecosystems and the implications of our failure to do so. Okay, um, I think with that, oh, sorry. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. <laughs> Okay. Um, so I did shop, stop sharing, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So <laughs> we're in a big group again. Um, I just want to say thank you and, um, you know, kind of I, I hopefully open it up for questions um, and uh, a discussion potentially um, about, you know, uh, the work or, you know, potential the future of the project and, and you know, where it's going. Um, I really hope to, to work in person with a, a number of you uh, folks after, you know, we, we wade through another version of the, of the pandemic here. So. Uh, Will, I'm, I'm just going to jump in. Can you okay. hear me? I uh, can. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, um, you know, this opportunity to hear a bit about your own work and, and um, to hear you talk about this lecture series and, and your work uh, with students at Diné College. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, a tremendous opportunity for all of us, for, for the students and, and the faculty to be able to, to work with you. Um, and my question, um, a number of the people on this call are um, students who are new to the study of art and um, some who are new to photography. And I just wondered if you could um, say a little bit about how your work um, uh, bridges so many different um, fields of investigation and, and you know, um, maybe how um, you might uh, encourage them to, to to think about um, um, this exploration of photography in a, in a totally new way. I mean, I think your work um, definitely bridges um, surveying and environmental studies and political activism and, and also fine arts, fine arts photography. And um, I just would be curious if, you know, you had something to say to new students about what it means for you, um, you know, to be able to, to work in such, um, yeah, an interdisciplinary way. Um, okay, uh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, you know, I think one of the things that I, I, I've always kind of fall, fallen back on or thought about as a foundation is um, kind of thinking about how photography is viewed like historically by indigenous people and particularly, you know, um, Diné folks. Um, I mean, I think that historically, you know, most indigenous communities, the way that knowledge and history was transmitted was orally, right? So there wasn't this written archive of, of history and narrative. It was all held within, you know, individuals and shared like in a community, you know, um, 
I thought it was really telling recently. I heard, I think Dr. Waletto or, or maybe it was President uh, Russell talk about um, medicine people and knowing all of these these ceremonies and songs and how, you know, like the Yevache is like nine nights of like, it's like this encyclopedic knowledge. Um, and, and what is like, how do you, how do you bring that idea to photography, which is this super, you know, like powerful describing tool, like, and it, and it freezes, you know, a moment in time and and it it holds a story in a different way and and i think you know i think back to that kind of i guess it's this hollywood adage about how indians are afraid of photography because it'll steal your soul you know i mean i think that you're talking about people who have an incredibly um nuanced relationship to representation and story and you know obviously they're going to be suspicious of anything that can hold that much information you know and so i think about it kind of in that way and i guess like having that as a foundation makes me think that i've got to be careful about the things that i make and the things that i image and you know there's the potential that it might actually come into being or at least that you know kind of having that foundation like is is an inspiration for me to kind of try and think complexly in a complex way about what I'm making before I kind of put it out there. Uh, so I don't know, that was kind of a roundabout way of answering your question, but you know, I mean, I think that um, I think for students who are you know uh, at Dene College, like you have incredible stories to tell, you know, and you're you're in the middle of it, like right in the backyard, you know, how you put those together, you know, in, in the telling, I think is, is the challenge. Um, but I think you have incredible source material and you also have an incredible foundation to kind of like work from. Um, so. We can open the questions up to the, the students. Um, if you're not comfortable, you could put the, your question in the chat or you could go ahead and just turn your mic on and um, ask your questions for Will. Hello, um, this is Brian Russell. Um, I, I watched your, uh, uh, a few of your documentaries and stuff and um, I really liked your uh, your photography that um, the metal tin. Um, I don't oh, know yeah. what that is. I just like the way it comes up. Like I mean, the process of it. I'm also a photographer. I you know I got into it because of my because of my father. You know, uh -huh. and, and uh, I've, I've always loved it. But I got into it back when it was still home and stuff. And when it was transitioning, you know, getting into the digital cameras, they're so expensive and stuff. I always thought, you know, technology, you know, technology totally took the intimacy out of the dark room. And <laughs> Oops. he was Brian was breaking up or he froze. Yeah, he did. We lost him. Oh, no. Oh, he's back. Hey, Brian. Sorry, you kind of broke out a lot. Um, can you repeat the last yeah. bit? Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 I just like the those metal tin photos that you did. I don't know the process about it. You know, um, I still like developing film, even though the quality isn't as good as you know digital. And it's just, you know, I think you're, you know, those, the, that, I don't know what that type is, that, that metal type. I can, I mean, that, that makes me think of something. It, it, it's called tin type. It's a, it's wet plate photography. And I mean, one of the things that I would love to do is come out and share the process with y'all at Dene College. Or maybe you guys could come to Santa Fe. I don't know, but you know, it'd probably be easier for me to go out there. 
Um, this is actually a photograph that I made of N. Scott Mamaday, um, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, um, writer. Um, so, you know, I, I love this image. And, and I think part of it was a response to the kind of digital revolution. Like uh, I finished grad school without ever um, doing a digital photograph, you know, and then all of a sudden it happened super quick. Um, so in some ways, you know, I, I love doing this because it's it's handmade. Um, and it also gives me the the ability to share the process too because so many people don't know what a dark room is anymore um so you know we get to we get to like spend you know an hour making a portrait um and then i have this other project that i've been doing and so i usually gift these to the individuals um after you've done the portrait um sorry um so yeah, I I told I feel you. I I miss the dark room all the time, and you know, luckily here in Santa Fe we have a great dark room. So so we still teach it here. Um. We have a couple questions in the chat. Um, one of the questions says, "Does Mr. Wilson's photo uh, photograph any of the people affected by the uranium sites?" Sorry. Um, Let's see, affected by them. I don't think I've I've photographed anybody in particular who's been affected by uranium. It's interesting. I've literally done thousands of portraits now with the with the tin types. Um, I one of the one of the things that we want to do with the project is e interview community members who have been affected by you know the uranium um but there's a process uh and it's a process that is kind of closely held by Diné college and, and the navajo nation and it's called like the irb process the internal review board process and it's something that i think we're gonna have to like navigate and learn about and and potentially propose uh before we actually do it right and it's you know it's about protecting people and kind of i guess collecting their images and getting their stories in a respectful way um so i mean i'm sure i have photographed someone but i haven't like incorporated it into this body of work that i've been doing um so i mean i think that's one of the things we want to do um I mean, I think about people in my own family who have been affected um, as as potentially a, a starting point. Um. Um, another question in the chat says, hello, um, Noel Smith here, reporter from the Farmington Daily Times. Interesting project. Do you seek permission before photographing these sites? Seek permission from who? <laughs> Great question. I, I remember one of your talks, Will, that you one time mentioned that you were photographing, you just went out and photographed and some, one of the workers had came out and they started talking to you, asking what were you photographing um, and that they wanted to get you in contact or I don't remember something simple, something like that. I guess you could talk about that a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I think there is like a tension between like, you know, a citizen of the Navajo Nation who's trying to do this documentary project um, and I think if I was photographing another person, I would certainly seek that permission. You know, I, I wouldn't just pull out my camera and be like, oh, I'm going to take this picture. Um, I've focused on the Western uh, Navajo AUMs because that's where my family is and, you know, in part where I grew up. Um, and so those regions uh, or those mines are mostly, you know, off of public roads um, on the nation, um, you know, some of them towards where my family sheep camp are. Um, so I haven't officially sought permission from anyone in particular to take those images. Um, some other questions. Uh, did you receive any backlash from visiting Uranian mines and taking photos of them? And then the other question, I guess it's kind of, I guess it goes kind of hand in hand. Um, when you go out to photo and take photos, 
uh, do you experience any risks such as contamination or any authority figures um, or anything like that? Um, I mean, I do, I think the drone is an amazing tool and, and I do look at those reports, you know, those publicly available reports. And I, and I think about where I'm going to position myself in relation to where the, you know, the abandoned uranium mine site was. And the drone enables me to make photographs of that without actually like walking, um, in the space. Um, I have, I think the the one place that i was kind of confronted by by i guess an employee of one of the the remediation sites was actually not on the navajo nation it was um near grant um one of those remediation sites and an employee came out you know and kind of asked me and you know i brought down the drone and i had a conversation with them kind of explained my project and the process um and you know, I don't know. I, I, that's what I can do at this point. I can just be honest about like, you know, what I'm doing. And, you know, if somebody doesn't want me to photograph, um, their particular site, I'm not going to fight them. <laughs> you know, I will, I will respect their space and, and move on. Um, um well when taking photos of these sites were you ever sued um another question have you brought your art installations to the navajo, navajo nation i haven't brought the um this project in particular i mean except through our like uh new collaboration uh with Zune college so i'm hoping that you know that we'll have exhibitions um about this uh issue um, and that, you know, Diné College students are hopefully inspired by this and like we can work collaboratively to create some of this work. Um, I have shown some of the other work, the autoimmune response work at the Navajo Nation Museum. Um, we saw we showed the eye dazzler, which was that weaving uh, at the Navajo Nation Fair in Window Rock as part of the art, you know, the art component of the fair. Um, and we actually won first place in, in uh, I can't remember what the, it was like multimedia art or something like that. Um, but we brought the Hogan uh, and, you know, we had the, um, the, the weaving, the eye dazzler there in sight for people to kind of check out and see. And then um, will will Mr. Wilson incorporate more of the Navajo stories into his future work? I hope so. <laughs> um, I mean, one of the things like that I could talk about is is that the structure that was in that installation, um, the roof of the Hogan is a geodesic dome, right? And it it I was doing research about the first atomic bomb, which is called the gadget. Uh, because I wanted to kind of reference that. And it turns out that the geometry of that dome is very similar to what was called the explosive lenses of the first nuclear weapon. So like the geometry, they had like uh, explosives that would focus the energy of the explosion all to the center. And that was where the plutonium core was. And once all of that energy kind of was Kind of compressed in one space that's what created the critical mass that made the giant explosion and created the chain reaction but in my installation rather than putting you know uranium or, or plutonium at the core i used um corn pollen so tetadine uh so it was kind of like a beauty bomb you know um so you know kind of incorporating that 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 component i guess that traditional component and transforming the narrative of that space is is what I was hoping to do. Um, and then do you know anyone? Okay, so I'm going to butcher this word. Do you know anyone studying, I cannot pronounce that word, but plants um, to remove uranium toxins from the soil and water? Thanks, beautiful and important work. Yeah, there's, um, there's actually a project that that's I think happening at Laguna um, 
you know, and one of the dreams for this project is actually to get um, the the Secretary of Interior to be part of the the speaker series. But we'll, we'll, who knows if that'll happen? Uh, Deb, Deb Holland, you know, who's a Laguna woman and now you know one of the most important people in, in the administration. Um, but here at the Santa Fe Community College, one of the professors, he was working with algae and using algae to do um, remediation. And I think they also use fungus because there's something about algae and fungus, like it's not hurt, but it thrives on the, the radioactivity and it actually can process it and make it kind of neutralize it. Um, so unfortunately that guy, he passed away in an accident. So the project is kind of on hold. Um, but some of that work is is happening here at the Santa Fe Community College. Um. We um, we're almost done. I can take probably like one more one more uh, question. Is that is that good for you? Does that work for you, Will? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I. Okay. I'm... Um, I guess the last question was Michael's. Um, hello, what advice would you give to a Danette student that might be interested in the field of photography? Uh, take some classes from from your amazing professor, uh, <laughs> uh, Ms. Cruz. Um, and, you know, I, I think that you have to be uh, determined <laughs> um, and you really have to believe in yourself and, and your work and what you're doing. Um, I also think that like learning about the history of it has kind of uh, been an important thing for me and kind of inspired me um you know to to kind of direct my projects in specific ways when i think of the survey photography that i'm doing now i'm kind of thinking about that as a as a maybe a continuation or a response to the history of survey photography that happened in the you know american west after you know the mexican american war in 1848 and the treaty of guadalupe when the united states kind of acquired let's say the the American Southwest, they sent out photographers, you know, um, and I think looking at that history and, and making a comparison between that work and the work that, you know, I'm doing now, it certainly gets, it adds a, a critical edge to the work, I think. So like learning history, you know, being a diligent student um, and not giving up <laughs> because, you know, I mean, we got this amazing grant, but I've literally written hundreds of grants, um, you know, kind of building up to this this point and gotten rejected from the vast majority of them. Um, so have a thick skin. <laughs> I second that 100%. You have to have a thick skin. <laughs> have to. Out of all the no's, you're going to get a couple of yeses. Um, other than that, I think, um, are, do you want to wrap it up, Will? Do you want me to take one more question? I leave it up to you. Okay, I, I would just, you know, say thank you so much. And, uh, you know, keep an eye out for the next um, speaker in, in the speaker series. And, you know, hopefully I'll get to meet a lot of you and work with you um, during some workshops uh, on site. And, you know, we're going to hopefully create a collaborative exhibition and potentially a publication. So I think it's a really exciting time to be uh, a Diné College student in, in the arts in particular, uh, because there's a lot going on. Um, so yeah. Thank, thank you so much, much Will. Um, if you want, I if you're okay, is it okay if I give them their, your email if they want 